I want to start with a true story. I'm sitting on a couch in your fellowship hall. We're all greeting one another, passing the peace with some silliness thrown in. It's, it's quite energetic. I gleefully give a high five to one of your former pastors. Then we stop. Instantly filled with fear, we touched hands. We broke physical distancing. Apologies are being offered. There's, there's some upheaval as we're scrambling for hand sanitizer. All of this has gotten us distracted from our worship preparations and we've lost track of times. We, we start rushing to get into place to start the Zoom call and live stream. I'm trying to get myself together. I'm not sure where my phone is. I'm, I'm, I'm at the church, not in my study turned studio. My, my sermon isn't ready. At least I'm fully dressed. Finally, finally I'm waking in some relief in my own bed. It's only Tuesday morning as it turns out and it was all just a dream, but that is that is a true story. It was a dream of your fellowship hall. Well, well sort of. My memories of this, that space are much stronger than my memories of your sanctuary. I've led adult education there. You've extended hospitality there to, to trans faith and living water and to the alternative seminary on various occasions. No doubt there are many more examples of folk who have benefited from your hospitality. I have gathered there with loved ones for sacred, sometimes difficult conversations. But I started hearing about Germantown Mennonite long before I ever set foot in the building, maybe 25 years ago. Philly is a small town, and the list of openly queer-friendly churches was pretty short when I moved here in 1994. I, I say here <laughs> as if I were in Philadelphia, but I'm actually sitting in New Jersey now, today, this morning. Everything is mixed up and discombobulated, isn't it? I am no Apostle Paul, nor a civil rights icon like Dr. King. I am Mix Chris, an administrator for the kingdom, set apart for quirky ministries and prophetic disruption. I bring you this epistle to the Germantown Mennonites. To all in Rome, or uh, in Germantown, to, to everyone around the world who may be joining us on this Zoom, well, as it turns out, in this pre-recorded video to all who join us, to all who are listening in, you are beloved by God. You are loved. You are called to be God's holy people. Grace and peace to you from God, our parent, and from our sibling, Jesus Christ. Grace and peace to you. I bring you greetings from Living Water United Church of Christ to the east and from Tabernacle United Church to the west, though we too are spread out across the internet. internet. Grace and peace to you. I bring you greetings from multi-faith communities like Trans Faith and Otherwise Engaged Publishing, among whom the internet has always served as our primary tool for finding one another. Grace and peace to you. First, I thank the God of my understanding through Jesus Christ for all of you, because I have heard of your faithfulness for many years now. I remember you and join with you in these strange times from a distance. I long to see you. I want you to know that Pastor John and I had planned for me to come to see you face to face, as you have received me many times before. We planned for me to at least be with you by Zoom. Instead, I want to invite you to dream and imagine with me from a distance. To do that well, I need for us to remember that we are not the first Christians who have lived in an empire known for its greed and violence. In Romans chapter 1, Paul said they invent ways of doing evil. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. End quote. It seems all too familiar to me. We live in a strange world where I can go on Wikipedia to conf confirm that Paul's epistle to the Romans was likely written all of 20 or 20, maybe 25 years after Jesus was crucified. I don't need Wikipedia to know that Jesus was just one of many set up to, and left to die by the Roman Empire. 
but Wikipedia cites ancient sources like Josephus to say that thousands were crucified, just like Jesus. We sometimes forget that he was one of so many who were abused and then left for dead. Thousands, thousands of dead, for the sake of some greater good in an empire, to keep the so-called peace. Yes, crucifixion is like the lynching trees that Pastor John spoke about last week. But more than that, the crucifixion was not vigilante justice. It was not an opportunistic, extrajudicial assassination. The crucifixion was a government execution. The horror of the crucifixion was just empire doing what empire does. Pitting the vulnerable one against the other, leaving a bunch of, quote, nobodies to die, alone, struggling for breath, struggling to breathe, making it so hard to survive that folk will do just about anything for a bag of silver. In Dr. King's 1956 letter to American Christians, he spoke eloquently of technological advances through the 20th century. He said, it seems to me that your moral progress lags behind your scientific progress, I am impelled to write you concerning the responsibilities laid upon you to live as Christians in the midst of an unchristian world. That is what I had to do. That is what every Christian has to do." End quote. Indeed, that is what all Christians must continue to do over and over again. And so, like the Roman Christians of Paul's time, like the American Christians of King's time, we once again, or better said, we still to this day live in a time of empire. Notwithstanding neoliberal virtue signaling and the comforts of the modern world that may lull us into compliance and complicity under one banner of progress or another, we know that progress under this empire just like all the rest, is only for some and not for others. In 1956, King said, they tell me that one-tenth of one percent of the population controls more than 40 percent of the wealth, end quote. In this century, we talk about the one percent, and we're led to believe that this represents more than 50 years of progress. The more things change, the more they stay the same. Now, there are lots of things about Paul's writing that make me uncomfortable, from the way he talks about gender to the way he talks about slavery, from the way he talks about Jewish law to the way he talks about the blood of Jesus. And I'm going I'm, I'm to let you sort that out on your own, or at least save it for another day. That's There's a whole bunch of sermons to be had in, in there. I'm not going there. But what I appreciate about Paul is that he was writing from a distance to other Christians who were also struggling to figure out what it all meant. So in that way, I am like Paul, writing to you, speaking to you, recording for you from a distance. We are in a watershed time, in a time of historic change, in a time of turning. May that turning include our repentance. Not just because of this thing called COVID-19, but because greed and selfishness, too, have been spreading like a virus, justified by all manner of arguments about what is most important. We need not look past the paper products aisle at the supermarket to be reminded the system is badly broken and easily exploited by those who think only of personal profit. Underneath the presenting questions from inadequate protective equipment in our hospitals to decisions about relaxing the lockdown, underneath are deep and abiding questions about who this society is designed to serve, who is to be made comfortable, and who is considered an acceptable sacrifice for the so-called greater good. Even religious folk are having conversations about acceptable risk and who we might be willing to put in harm's way for the sake of the market or the economy or to be able to eat meat products or to resume in-person religious services. We live in a time where something as fundamental as singing a song together in a strange land 
is likely to get some of us killed, not because of persecution for our faith, but because that activity may or may not quicken the spread of COVID-19 among us. The science is unfolding before our eyes, but the stakes are high. What can we learn from this present moment? How can we use this moment to help us dream of a different kind of world? Thousands are already being left for dead as collateral damage while we argue over what to do next. Once again, Christians must reimagine what it means to be church in the face of both a debilitating disease and a genocidal administration. We are not the first to have faced such questions and we will not be the last. King's letter to American Christians was a sermon preached on day 335 of the Montgomery bus boycott. Paul was trying to figure out in the shadow of the Roman Empire. Christians in Nazi Germany were trying to figure it out. I need not remind you that the early Mennonites were trying to figure it out too. Dream with me, will you? Imagine with me another new future for Christian witness. Maybe from this distance we can begin to see what God is asking for us in this season of change. How are we being invited to transform our Christian witness for such a time as this? What new ways of being church are called for in these strange times? How have generations before us needed to be transformed when facing history-altering challenges? What new models of leadership might emerge through our discernment around this moment of holy disruption? How might we make the most of this opportunity? What does it mean to love one another like Jesus when we are being asked to make tough decisions about the greater good? What does it even mean to be the body of Christ in times like these? What does it mean to remember that we are all connected even if from a distance? How might we learn from this moment about how to better serve and prioritize the vulnerable among us, the young and the aging, the disabled and the chronically ill, the undocumented, the poor, the socially isolated, and those experiencing homelessness or the other side of the digital divide? How can we keep from falling back into old ways of being once the immediate risks of COVID-19 have passed? What does the transformation of our minds even have to do with the church buildings that have offered us sacred sanctuary over so many generations? How is this empire we are living under similar to or different from others in recorded history? How does our transformation occur in relationship with this particular empire? What new challenges are embedded in that relationship? How are we being tempted? to conform to the patterns of this world? How might we challenge ourselves to resist easy answers and see, seek out nuance together, even if from a distance? I love bodies and Sunday morning hugs and communion and the sacred spaces that we create by sharing our lives together. Still, as Christians, we proclaim an upside-down kingdom, perhaps one where we love one another by keeping our distance, perhaps by drawing near to one another in new and mysterious ways that no generation before us could even imagine. I'm not here to give you quick or easy answers for the difficult questions of our time. Sorry about that. Indeed, I myself am convinced, my siblings, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with knowledge and competent to instruct one another. We know that the whole creation has been groaning, as in the pains of childbirth, right up unto the present time. Still, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through the one who first loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any power neither height nor depth, nor any virus in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our president. Oh, how I wish that I could be with you in person so that I could say to you face to face what I am forced to say to you now by recording. Oh, how I long to share your fellowship. And meanwhile, God be with you and among you 
and in the transforming of our minds, and now unto Zay, who is able to keep us from falling, and lift us from the fatigue of despair to the buoyancy of hope, from the midnight of desperation to the daybreak of joy, to Zem be power and authority forever and ever. Amen.